Hello and welcome to the Hour of Code. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting or teaching yet, my name is Mr. Baumgarten and I'll be your guide through this next hour or so of uh, exploring coding. First of all, is this session for you or should you be using the existing tutorials on websites such as code.org? Uh, the quick and simple answer to that is if this kind of puzzle you have done multiple times before and does it not uh, strike you as something that would be at all a challenge, then this tutorial is probably for you. Okay, if you're familiar with the idea of using these repeat until, until loops and these if loops, so if we were to look at this problem, we would want to move forward in a repeat loop through all these blocks, right? such as like that, and if the path turns to the right, then we are going to want to turn right, and that will allow us to move forward. Oop, path goes to the right, so we turn right, keep going, moving forward, path goes to the right, so we turn right, and we hit the sunflower, which is where we would stop. So now if I hit run, this will solve the problem. Okay, and there are many different variations upon this theme on the code.org website, but if this strikes you as something you have done multiple times before, then this tutorial is probably for you. If that strikes you as something that is you haven't seen before, you haven't done much of these before, then maybe you should be using a code.org tutorial. Uh, so just speak to your teacher about that. So by the end of this hour of code session, uh, the objective is that you will have produced a simple breakout game, something akin to what you can see here on the screen, where the ball is bouncing off the paddle and knocking out various bricks. And we keep score based upon how many bricks you knock out. That's a simple breakout game. So you probably won't finish the breakout game in the time allotted, but all the videos will be there available for you to complete it if you wish. Uh, we are also organising a competition for those students who complete these, these tutorials uh, and wish to have a go at creating something of their own. So ask your teacher about that at the end of the session. Also, since this is taking a video form, please remember to make use of that fact by pausing and rewinding as necessary so that you can follow along with what's going on. Uh, because I will uh, preempt right at the start that because time is so limited, uh, I will have to race over some of the theory quite fast. But if you do follow along the instructions, you should still definitely have a working game at the end of the sessions. Uh, I do have got video lessons that I've created for my ASA, uh, which are s slower and more explained if uh, programming is something that you are interested in learning more about, then please feel free to make use of those videos. All right, with that said, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing you are going to need is to install a Chrome app called Coding with Chrome. Uh, so if you click on your Chrome apps icon, uh, this is what we're looking to install. So if I just flip back to Chrome, if you go to your Chrome app web store, simply type in coding with Chrome into the search box. And it is an app. And I'm going to type that again. Hit enter. And it's still have... scroll down to apps, coding with Chrome. Okay, install that, add that to your Chrome browser. Once you've got that loaded, this is the welcome screen that you'll see for Coding with Chrome. Okay, welcome to Coding with Chrome. Uh, we're going to go straight into the advanced area, so use advanced mode, then into programming, and then into JavaScript. And finally, we will click on a new empty project. And this is the screen that you'll see and that we will be working in for the next little while. So how do we use coding with Chrome? Okay, so it is using the JavaScript programming language. Uh, and there are a few other little niceties that have been added to it with COVID, uh, to make things a little easier for beginners in coding with Chrome. So we'll be making use of those as well. So for example, if I want to, want to draw a little circle, I'll just simply click here in my text coding area and I'll use the command draw.circle open some brackets and inside the brackets I will provide parameters or the extra information that 
uh, this draw dot circle uh, command needs to know in order to be able to draw me a circle. So if I put in the numbers 150, 150, 100, for instance, okay, and I close my bracket, and I click over here. This is my uh, the screen or the stage where I will see what I've produced. I hit my play button and I will get a big circle drawn. Okay, so what's going on here? Just a quick introduction. This is uh, this is the X for the center point of my circle. This is the Y value for the center point of my circle. And this is my radius value for my circle. So uh, we can think of this stage here as an X and Y coordinate plane, just like you're used to with maths, with X going across horizontally and Y going vertically. So the top left corner is a zero, zero. All right, so X is zero here and it increases along here to, you know, the, well, on my screen is about five, 600 across at the outer edge. Okay, and it's opposite to the Cartesian plane for your Y axes. So Y is zero at the top and increases as we go down. So this is about, this is Y 150 here. And we keep going down to Y about 300, 400, 500, 600 as we go down. Okay, and it will be similar on your computers as well. We have other shapes that we can draw and we'll be using, such as draw dot rectangle. Now, on the circle, this, the x and y value we gave was for the center point of the circle, and then we provided a size for the radius. On the rectangle, the x and y values that we provide are for the top left corner. So, for instance, if I put 150, 150 again in here, the rectangle that we will end up with should start at the center point of the circle. Now, for a rectangle, we need more than just the top left corner. We also need to know the width and the height. So if I give this a width of say 300 and a height of 200, okay, and then we end all of our commands with semicolons. Okay, you can see now that I've got a rectangle that's emanating from the center point of the circle. Now both of these commands also have an optional additional, uh, some optional additional commands we can provide, such as on the circle here, if I Inside quotes, if I put the color or the word blue, my circle will now be blue. And on the rectangle, let's put pink. Okay, so uh, the quotes uh, for any time I'm wanting to use a value that is of text, uh, which in programming parlance is known as a string, uh, they start and end with a quote so that we know where the text begins and ends. As opposed to numbers, we don't need that because as soon as the computer encounters something that's not a number, it knows that the number has ended. Alrighty, so we've drawn a couple of basic shapes. That's all very well and good. Let's start building our breakout game. Okay, so let's start thinking about the components of our breakout game. We need to have a little ball that is bouncing off of walls and paddles and bricks and things like that. We need to have our paddle down below, which we're going to control with our mouse. And then we need to have all of our bricks that are going to be drawn for the ball to hit. So let's modify what we've got here. If we're going to have a ball that's bouncing around, it needs to, it needs to change its position. Okay? And we know that a, a circle, which is what we're going to use for our ball, right, the, the first two numbers are the x and the y value that represent its position. So how can we change these in our program? Let's get rid of this rectangle. Uh, and the trick to use uh, the trick to doing this is by using what's known as variables, and these are simply memory locations uh, that uh, can store some information that we can then uh, read and access, and we can also control, manipulate, and change. So, for instance. If I put in the, the keyword var, it's short for variable, so I'm creating a variable and I'm going to call it x and I'm going to give it the number 150. I'm going to create another variable, call it y, and give that 150. So in my circle here, instead of just typing in, I want this circle to be at 150, I'll replace the first 150 with the x and I'll replace the second one with the y. 
Now this is still going to draw a circle in exactly the same spot, but this time we're taking the number 150, we're storing it into x, and then here in our draw circle command we're seeing what is the value stored inside x, and we're using that. And the same with it. y, and we put the number 150, store it into this thing called the letter y, and then here we're asking well, what's stored inside y, it's the number 150, and so we get the circle drawn. But it does mean now I can start changing these numbers if I want. Okay, and my circle moves along. Uh, probably not so noticeable with that small change, it make a big change, and you can see, okay, my circle has definitely moved. Uh, and I can also perform additional calculations with these numbers along the way. Uh, so for instance, if I put in the command y equals y plus 300 and refresh that, my circle is now down at the bottom corner of my screen. So let's just take a quick moment to look at what's going on here, because mathematically this does not make sense as an equation in the form that you're used to. Okay, but this is the way that programming languages perform their calculations. Uh, the general principle to think of it is that it is performing a calculation with whatever is on the right hand side of the equal sign and it stores the answer in whatever is on the left. So in this case, y plus 300. Well, so what is currently inside y? So before we have done anything with this command, uh, the letter y has the value 150. So this is saying look up the value that's in y, 150, add 300 to it, which would be 450, and then store the answer into y. So that by the time draw circle is looking at y, it has the number 450 inside it. Okay, so just take a moment to get your head around that, uh, because that is a key concept for what's going on. All right, it'll perform the calculation that's on the right and store the answer in whatever we put here on the left. All right, so we didn't actually have to make it y equals y. We could be, for instance, updating the value that's inside x. And that would be perfect, perfectly valid. We'd be saying take 150, add 300 to it, and store that value in x. And so this circle is now got an x value in the center of 450. Now, we can take this concept and simply build on it. To make a ball that is moving across the screen, right, every... A uh, fraction of a second, we can change, perform calculations to adjust values that are inside x and y and make it look like a ball is moving. So how can we do that? If we, we want something to happen uh, every fraction of a second, JavaScript has a handy little uh, feature within it. And so I'm just going to come up here to the top and I'm going to type in the command set interval. Uh, and let's call this loop, and I'm going to put the number 40. Okay, so now you'll get an error message here. Loop is not defined. That's fine because we haven't defined it yet. I'm just going to quickly explain what's going on. All right, set interval is basically the command that in initializes the timer function within JavaScript. The 40 represents how many milliseconds between. Uh, on the clock between executing these commands do I want JavaScript to be waiting. Okay, so every 40 milliseconds we're telling JavaScript to look for and run a command called loop. Now we don't have anything here called loop at the, at the moment so we're going to create that in a second. Uh, so for every 40 milliseconds there's 1000 milliseconds in one second so by putting the number 40 here this is going to execute 25 times per second. So let's make this thing called loop. Okay, and the way we do this is we write the, the keyword function, right, and then the word loop. I'm going to open and close a set of round brackets, and then open and close a set of curly braces. All right, this is now my loop function. Okay, and uh, what a function is, is essentially we're going to be pretty well using it as a way of grouping different statements or commands together, such as these, okay, and grouping them all together so they can be accessed through this one reference name, in this case called loop. And we put those commands inside the curly braces. So if I move my cursor to be in between them and enter, whatever is between the open and the close curly brace, 
will get executed every time this function called loop is run. So if, for instance, if I take my draw circle and I cut and paste that into my loop function, all right, this is now drawing a circle and redrawing a circle 25 times a second or every 40 milliseconds. And how can I prove that this is constantly redrawing? Well, let's change, ask JavaScript to make changes to these X and Y values. So instead of having this command here, all right, how about I put in here Y is equal to Y plus one. And you'll see now that I have this big, long, growing shape which is gradually moving down. So what's happening is we started with one circle and then we moved down one pixel, drew a new circle, moved down one pixel, drew a new circle, moved down one pixel, drew a new circle. Okay, and so we're getting lots of circles being drawn over the top of each other. Now this is all well and good, but in our program, we're going to want uh, just the appearance of one circle that's moving rather than one circle continually being drawn over on top of all the other circles. So how can we do that? Well, we, we actually kind of cheat a little bit and we just draw a big white rectangle over our whole screen to clear it or give the effect of clearing it every time that we run our loop. So I'm going to insert a new statement here for draw rectangle. And if I want it to clear the whole screen, then it's going to have to start at the top here, 0, 0. So 0, comma, 0. And I want it to be as wide as the screen is and as high as the screen is. Well, how do I know how high and wide my screen is? It changes uh, depending upon the computer that I'm using. Thankfully, JavaScript has a couple of uh, little tricks up its sleeve that allows us to automatically find out. To know how wide our screen is, we use a, a uh, so that basically an automatic variable. Right? So we created these variables, x and y, and there are some that always ex automatically exist within JavaScript that will tell us the size of our screen. You just need to know what they're called. So in this case, we're going to use window.innerWidth right, for our, the width of our screen, and window.innerHeight. Right, these are case sensitive, so uppercase w, uppercase h. All right, and you can see now we've got our circle that is moving. Uh, now I want to make it white, so I'm going to put in my color command. And now it looks like I've got my circle that's simply moving. Uh, and I can change my x value as well if I want. Let's, let's make x move to the left by putting in a subtraction. And you can see that my circle is slowly moving down and to the left. All right, and so we're going to uh, just modify this slightly and this creates our ball that's moving around the screen. So let's make it a little bit smaller. Um, five. Okay, that's about the right size that I want for my Pong game. Right, a little ball that's moving along and I need it moving a little bit faster. So let's try adding and subtracting five from it each time. All right, and that's moving at a decent speed to get started with my game. Now the next thing I'm gonna to want to do is to make my ball be bouncing off the edges so that it stays on the screen. So how can I do this? I can use what's known as an if command, an if statement. So I'm gonna insert another blank line. And basically what's happening is, right, my x is getting smaller and smaller, approaching zero. And then it's actually still getting drawn here, right, and we're just continually taking five off of it. So x will become minus five, minus 10, minus 20, okay, and it's just appearing off of my stage. So I can check to see if x has become negative, then I don't want it to become negative anymore. All right, so if x has become less than zero, right, and so you can see this kind of works the same as our function. All right, I've got a keyword, I've got something inside round brackets, and then I've got a set of curly braces. So basically what will happen is, if whatever question I put here in my round brackets is true, then it will execute the code that is in my curly braces. Okay, so what can I put in here that will take care of this situation of where x becomes less than zero? All right, and this is where I'm gonna create another couple of variables. 
it's not the top here, my x direction right, is minus 5. And so now, down here, instead of having minus 5, I'm going to replace this with adding my x direction. And we'll see the circle still works exactly the same. In this calculation, right, we're taking whatever the value was in x and we're adding whatever is in this x direction value, okay, which happens to be minus 5. So we're still subtracting 5 off of it each time. But what I'm going to do now is with this if statement, if we've become less than 0, right, to give the effect of bouncing off this wall, instead of subtracting 5 each time, I want to start adding 5 and it will start moving back the other way. So all I need to do then is if x has become smaller than 0, I'm going to say x direction is going to become positive 5. And now, as we run our code, we'll see that the ball should bounce off. Right, it's got the appearance of bouncing off this, uh, uh, this left edge. And I, just, I can do the same for my other edges, and all of a sudden we'll have a ball that's bouncing. So if... All right, so the, the other place that it gets stuck is down here, y. If y becomes larger than, what's the bottom down here? Okay, that's the total height on my screen, which we already know how to access. We've got this thing up here. So if y becomes larger than my window dot inner height, all right, then I want, my, I want a y direction, so I need to create a y direction variable. And so here, this change, let's change this to y direction. All right, so if y becomes bigger than the inner height, then my y direction is going to have to become minus because I want it to start heading back up. And now if we watch our ball, bounce and bounce. Excellent. So this is working so far. Now I just need to do the same for these other two walls. All right, if x is bigger than window dot inner width then what do I want to change this time this if I'm bouncing off this wall I've been adding to my y value so I now need to start decreasing it so x direction becomes minus 5 and now for the top wall if y is less than 0 Right, my y value has been getting smaller and smaller until it becomes negative, so I need to start adding to my y value. So y direction. All right, and so as you can see, we have a ball that's bouncing back and forth between uh, these x and y coordinates and bouncing off all four sides. Fantastic. So we have the first part of our game happening. We've got a ball moving around. Let's try adding the second part now. Let's get a paddle here that we can use for the ball to bounce off of. All right, so we'll actually later on have to remove the bounce off the bottom basement, uh, if you like, of the game, uh, because the idea is that we use the paddle to keep the ball in, and if the paddle doesn't catch it, the ball just falls through and the game ends. All right, so. Let's create a paddle. Right, so a paddle is just, uh, we're just going to use a rectangle. Right, draw dot rectangle. We're going to uh, need an X and Y position for this. So let's just use 200 for, 200 for now. Uh, a paddle will probably use a width of about 50 and a height of about 20. And I'm just going to make my paddle black for now. You can make yours whatever color you want. Right, you can see here, if your eyes are really good, you catch that the paddle just suddenly appears and then disappears. Right, that's because we've got it down here. So it happens once when, when I restart my program. But then it's getting quickly erased by this. You know, because we're drawing this rectangle, this rectangle over the whole thing. 25 times a second. So I need my draw rectangle to actually be inside my loop if I want it to stay on screen. So that's fine, I'll cut and paste it into here. And there's my rectangle, let's get rid of this big red screen. All right, now that's not where I want the paddle for my game, I want it kind of just a little bit off the bottom. So instead of Y being 200, I'm gonna say, let's take whatever, 
I know that the bottom of my screen is this window dot in a height. So I'll copy that and paste it in here. All right, now we can't see it because this X and Y value is the top left corner of the rectangle. So it's, a, it's actually hanging just off the bottom here. So I'm gonna then take my window dot in a height and let's subtract 50 from it, for instance. And all of a sudden now we've got a rectangle that we can see. Because right, it's uh, 50 up from the bottom corner there. Now I want the X position of my rectangle to change according to where my mouse is. I'm going to use my mouse to move my paddle uh, around the screen to catch the ball. So how can I? How do I know where the mouse is? To find out where our mouse is, we're going to create another function, which we will get JavaScript to automatically execute whenever the mouse moves. So let's just call it mouse move. And this time, inside the round brackets, I'm going to just put the word event. Uh, and then we have our curly braces there. So how do I get JavaScript to run this function whenever the mouse moves? Well, I'm going to come up here where I've got my set interval. And this one is a little longer. It's document dot add event listener with a capital E and a capital L and this time inside quotes I'm going to use the, the magic command for mouse move and then I'm going to have mouse move again and call right so what's happening here I'm telling the document which is the fancy name for our screen happening here on the right to listen for an event what is the event I want it to listen to? I want it to listen to the event known as mouse move. So this is just an arbitrary name that JavaScript gave this command. And whenever mouse move happens, I want it to execute this function. All right, so it's only coincidence that these two names, these two words are the same. All right, they could be anything, uh, but in this case, it makes sense to use the same name. So execute this function so it's going to look for and find, oh, here's a function called mouse move. I'm going to execute that. Okay, so what do we want our mouse move function to do? Well, really, all I need is the X coordinate of where my mouse is. And then I want to somehow put it in here where my rectangle is being drawn so that my rectangle gets drawn at that same spot. How can I do that? Well, I can just create another variable to keep track of this so that one function can change it and then another function can listen to it. So let's just say call this the X for my paddle. All right, and it can start at 50 or whatever. But down here in mouse move, so every time the mouse moves, let's listen for and find out what the X. So every time the mouse moves, we want to find out where the mouse has moved to. And we do so by looking at this event thing. Uh, basically, this is this is information that JavaScript gives us regarding the event that we are listening for, which in this case was when the mouse moves. And so inside this event, uh, this variable is a, uh, a value called offset x. And that basically tells us the x value of the mouse within our canvas or our stage that we have here. So whatever value is in this thing, I want to store it in this x paddle. So x paddle is equal to the mouse coordinate that I moved to. And then when we draw our rectangle, we simply want to use the x paddle. Okay, so now if I look inside here, I now move my mouse and my paddle moves with me. Fantastic. Uh, now there is one slight little change we're going to make to this. Notice that the mouse moves, right? And as the mouse moves, it's the top left corner of the rectangle that is in line with the mouse, right? Because that's what this x value is. Now, it will be easier to play the game if the paddle is kind of centered upon where my mouse is rather than just the top corner of the map of the paddle so inside here whatever this x paddle is how about we so we know here that the width is 
50, so let's half, take half of that off of it, 25, and now you'll see that my panel is centered upon where my mouse pointer is. All right, so far we've got a ball bouncing off the, the walls, and we have a panel that's moving. The next objective is to make the paddle, is, sorry, is to make the ball bounce off the paddle. Uh, if the ball hits the paddle, then we just want to change our y direction. Uh, and ha so have it instead of uh, y increasing, we want it to start becoming negative because it's bounced off the paddle. Okay, so that's what we need to do to change the ball. How can we detect if we hit the paddle? Well, basically we just need to know if the ball is somewhere inside the x and y values taken up by the paddle. Right, which is from the top left corner through to the bottom right corner of that paddle. So we're basically going to use a bunch of if statements to do this. And we'll do it inside our loop so that every time we're redrawing and recalculating our ball position, we check to see if we bounced off the paddle. So, and I'm basically going to ask the questions, if the y, all right, so let's, let's start with x value. If the x value of the ball uh, between the left edge and the right edge of the paddle. So, all right, so x is the x coordinate of the ball. And if that is larger than or equal to, what's the left edge of my paddle? Well, I actually already know that. That's here, that's paddle minus 25, because that's the uh, top left corner is that and that. So, if x is greater than or equal to x paddle, minus 25. What do I put in the curly braces? Well, I also need to check to see if it's within the right-hand edge of the paddle. If x is less than or equal to, what's the right-hand edge of my paddle? Well, I know that my paddle goes for 50 pixels. If minus 25 is the left edge, then x paddle plus 25 would be my right edge. Okay, now I need to check my y values. What's the top of my paddle? Again, I already know that, that's right here. So if the y value for the ball is greater than or equal to height 50 And finally, what is the bottom edge of my paddle? Again, I know, okay, so if this is the top edge, and then this is the height that I'm drawing it, right, so it'll be that plus that, uh, which basically works out to be window inner height minus 30. So if y value for the ball is less than or equal to window dot inner height minus 30. If we're within the left edge and the right edge and the top edge and the bottom edge, then what do we want to do? We want to change our y direction so that it starts heading up. We want our y direction to get smaller, so we want to be subtracting 5 off of it after the bounce. So we want this. So y direction becomes minus 5. And now, hopefully, if I move my paddle there, the ball will bounce off my paddle. Let's get it back down here again. Yes, there we go. The ball is bouncing off my paddle. Fantastic. One more time. There we go. Okay, so the ball is bouncing off my paddle. One more thing done. Now we can change this. While we're at it, let's change uh, so that the ball no longer bounces off the bottom of my game. So here, if my if the ball has fallen through the bottom of the game, what do I actually want it to do? I actually want the game to be over at this point. So we can draw, instead of bouncing, we'll get rid of that. And we can draw a message on the screen using draw.text. Right, and then we can say game over, put in 250, say 300. And we'll make this red letters because it's big important news the game is over. There's only one slight problem with this at the moment. 
is that the time the ball is actually still moving. Uh, it's just moving off screen. So we'll also stop the timer so that our program basically ends. All right, and so to do that is I, I will just type in the command clear interval. Uh, and we want to clear the first interval that we created. So here we created an interval, we set it, and then here when the game is over, we'll just clear it so that the game stops. And that will stop that loop code from running. Right, which you will see now as I move my mouse, the paddle stops. The paddle is not to, uh, doing anything. When I didn't have that, right, if I just put a slash slash, a double slash turns uh, code into a comment, so it gets ignored by JavaScript. Okay, so it's, it uh, doesn't have an effect. So if I move my mouse out of the way, let the ball through, fall through the bottom. All right, we we'll see the mouse is still moving because this loop is still running, and so it's recap keeps drawing the rectangle and recalculating its new position. Whereas if I let that code take effect, uh, the mouse will stop moving. Fantastic. Okay, so just while we're talking about the idea of comments. Uh, it is actually really good programming practice to get used to the idea of putting in comments so that if another programmer is looking at your code, they can understand what's going on. So I'm actually just going to quickly insert a few comments here. Uh, so two slashes, uh, creates a new comment. So draw a rectangle to clear the screen. So just so that uh, when we come back to this later on, we understand what is going on. All right here. I'm going to move the ball. Right, and then here we uh, check if the ball bounces off of the left edge. Check if the ball falls through the bottom of the screen. Check if the ball bounces off of the right edge, check if the ball bounces off the top edge, and in here, check if the ball bounces off of the paddle. What else do I have going on in my loop? All right, draw the ball. Paddle. Now the code's a lot easier for someone else to understand if they happen to look at it. Let's move on to drawing our bricks. So we need a whole stack of bricks across the top here for the ball to be bouncing through. So let's uh, let's start drawing some bricks, shall we? Okay, so I'm going to use the same size and shape as my paddle for my bricks. I'm just going to put uh, 50 wide, 20 high, and a whole series of rectangles across the top. So let's uh, let's put these in. Let's insert it. Uh, new lines up here. Draw the bricks. I'm just stick with putting in some comments. Okay, so I'm going to draw a rectangle, and like I said, uh, so we'll just start with zero zero for now. This is, that's going to change, and bricks will be fifty wide, twenty high, and let's make it a black brick for now. Okay, so I've got a black brick up the top corner. Now, I'm going to want about 50 or so bricks in my game. How can I do this? I could copy and paste this line 50 times and keep changing these X and Y values. All right, so if, let's, let's have a bit of a gap on the first one. So 20 in from the side. All right, if it's 50 wide and I want a gap of about 20, all right, so if the previous one was 20, then the next one would have to be about 90. Okay, and then add another 70 to that would make the next one 160, and so on. You can see how I move my bricks across, and I don't really want them on the top edge. All right, let's bring them down by 20 as well. All right, so if I keep adding 70 each time, uh, this will give me 230, uh, 300, 370, uh, 430. Right, so we can see uh, that one's not right. What did I do there? Uh, 440. All right, so we can see I could keep doing that and adjust these x and y values each time, but that get, that gets quite monotonous, and I can let JavaScript work it all out for me. 
all right? Which, similar to our functions in our if statements, right? We've got the one keyword, we have some, we've got some round brackets, and we've got some curly braces. Okay, and whatever goes inside the curly braces is what will happen when the while loop is true. Okay, and like the if statement, basically, whatever I put, whatever question or condition I express inside the round brackets, while that is true, then this loop will keep executing. It'll run over and over and over and over whatever's inside here. So I can simply put in here one draw rectangle command. Okay, and if I've got a variable for uh, the x value for my brick, uh, and I wanted to start my first rectangle uh, with an x value of 20, okay, I can draw the rectangle at that x value. Keep everything else the same. All right, uh, and I wanted to increase by 70 each time. Sorry, x brick is equal to x brick plus 70. And all right, let's let's use this 440. Okay, while x brick is less than or equal to 440, and now I can get rid of all this, and this draws all my bricks for me. Okay, because it's simply increasing this x value by 70 each time and joining a new one. So I can change this 440. Let's add another 70 to that. I've 10, and now all of a sudden I've got an extra one. Now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's uh, add another 70 to that, make it 580, and I'll get nine bricks. Now, I want uh, I want rows of this. Okay, so I could, if I wanted to, uh, put in another row here by simply changing the Y value, uh, and then put in another one. But again, we're falling into the same trap. We're doing something fairly repetitious uh, and having manually updating the values each time. But when it comes to repetition, that's something that programmers do very well. So let's get rid of those and let our program do it for us by creating a Y brick value. All right, and we're gonna start off with 20. So we'll draw these bricks there. All right, and we can just put a while loop inside another one. So while the Y brick value is less than, uh, let's start with, let's say 100k. I'm gonna cut this line and paste it in here. All right, and at the end of each rectangle, let's increase our Y, our y brick. Oh, my lines all lined up. And we'll add what is it? So if it's got a height of 20 and a gap of 20, so we'll add 40 to it each time. Okay, and we're getting an error here. Brick is not defined, and that's because here I put the word brick, which is not a variable that I've created. I've created Y brick. Just also while we're on this, this little guy at the top here, all right, there's a little debugger. That should help uh, also spot some errors for you as you go, although it's not actually helping with this particular error. But if I put fix up my variable here and put Y in, right, I now have these three going down. All right, now the problem I've got to have here is this statement actually belongs in here because uh, I need to reset my Y back to 20 each time. Right, uh, otherwise, it'll just skip over all that because Y is already bigger than 100, and so nothing was getting drawn past the first row as you saw just then. So if I want uh, even more Y bricks, I just change this Y, and all of a sudden I've got another row. All right, so if I went all the way to 400, for instance, I'd get a crazy amount of rows. So we, you can adjust these numbers as you want, depending upon how many bricks you want, and JavaScript will automatically work it all out for you. Okay, so I'm gonna keep mine like that. Okay, nine bricks across, five bricks down, Sounds like a good number. Okay, so there is my bricks draw. Fantastic. Okay, so as far as the game is concerned, really the next thing we just need to worry about is is the ball hitting a brick? And if so, then the brick has you know gets killed and is cleared. 
and if not, then it keeps, you know, if the brick isn't there, then it keeps moving on through. I mean, if it is, yeah, it kills the brick and bounces. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, we're going to kill two birds with one stone doing this. And we're going to use what's known as an array. So back up the top here, I'm going to create an array. I'm going to call this bricks equals, and this time I'm going to use the square brackets. And inside here, I'm going to put the colors that I want my bricks to be, okay? Because it's, you know, it's a bit boring than all being white bricks. So let's put in some different colors in here. So we'll put in blue, let's put in some green bricks, some yellow, uh, magenta. Uh, what else have we got? We can use cyan. We get the idea. Orange. So basically, an array is is a variable, okay. But instead of it just being a variable with one value, it has multiple different values, and we use an index number to indicate which var which value we want. Offer. So there's six different values here. All right, let's create a new variable for this. Uh, yeah, we'll call it this bricks color. All right, and we'll start with the value of zero. So to access the individual elements for here, all right, uh, I use this variable. So instead of the word black, I can use bricks. And if I put a zero in here, it'll make them all blue, all right? Because I'm saying, give me the first item, uh, which is blue. If I change it to a one, they'll all go green. If I change it to a two, they'll all go yellow and so on. Uh, so, which brings me to one important point. Whenever computers count, they always count starting from zero, not one. So that's why saying bricks is zero is only the first item, which is blue. Okay, now rather than just putting in zero, one or two, I can also use a variable in this, in this place. So we'll use this variable that it's created, this bricks color. Right, and that will make it all blue because this brick's color is currently set to zero. So after I've drawn a brick, right, this brick's color is equal to this brick's color plus one. All right, so we will iterate through and we'll get some different colors showing through. So every time we draw a brick, we'll increase our color value so that the next brick gets drawn of the next color. Now the problem is we only have six colors here, okay, uh, but we've got more than six bricks. We'll just say if this bricks color is greater than however many colors we have here, okay, and there is a handy little thing with arrays that tells us how many items are in it, right, and that is through using dot length. In other words, bricks dot length, right, this currently has the number six in it. All right. If we're bigger than the than the length, we'll just say this bricks color is about zero, and so we'll iterate through all the different colors. We'll get these gray ones appearing because remember, like I said, computers start counting at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So we actually want to know if this value is bigger than bricks length minus, as well. There's six items. The last one is accessed through the number five. And now you see we got rid of the greys, and we just have our blue, green, yellow, magenta, cyan, and orange being rotated through. We're going to use a similar approach to tell if our brick is dead. Bricks alive. To do this, all right, this is where we need to know how many bricks we're going to draw. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. All right. Our vertically by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, horizontally, so there are 45 bricks. So if a brick is alive, we'll call it zero, shall we? So zero, 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 zero. Okay, this is where, this is the one bit of repetition we're gonna have to do. We need 45 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. 
45. Okay, so if you drew yours with a different number of bricks, you need to make sure you've got the right number of zeros in there to match your program. Okay, and so what we will do is whenever the brick is dead, we will work out which brick it is and we will set it to something other than zero. Only if it's set to zero that we will draw the brick. To do that, let's also just come in here. All right, if bricks alive, whatever this brick number is, all right, which is something we're going to have to create, we will then, that is when we will draw the rectangle. Okay, so we need to create this bricks number thing. All right, go here by brick number, start with zero. And every time we are having drawn or processed an individual brick, we will increase it by one now. Oh, sorry, so if bricks alive, all right, bricks number equals zero. Okay. We'll make this. So uh, what we've just done here is we're asking this question: Does all right for brick number zero through to forty-five? All right, look inside the array, get that record. So the first brick, the second brick, the third brick. If it is equal to zero, which is what triple equals is asking. Okay, is is this thing equal to zero? All right, previously we used less than or equal to signs. Okay, and the same without your statements down here. Yeah. Ask if it equals zero, if it, or if one number equals a number, we use the triple equals. We used single equals when we are making a change to a value. We use triple equals when we're doing a comparison between two values. Right, so the next thing we need to do is to be able to set a brick to no longer being alive. I change it to something other than a one. So at the moment, if, sorry, other than a zero. Uh, if I put ones in here, uh, you'll notice that bricks will start disappearing. So this is what we need the program to be able to do. We need to change these from zeros as the ball moves through and bounces off the brick. So let's do that after, as we move through here, uh, we've moved the ball, we've checked we've bounced off the edges. So let's put in here, Check if the ball bounces off a brick. It's going to look very similar to what we just did for bouncing off the paddle. All right, we need to check to see if the ball has moved into right, the space between the left edge, the right edge of a brick, and the top edge and the bottom edge of that brick. And if it has, then we will kill the brick. But we need to do it for all 45 bricks. This is where we can, we're going to get a little mathy and a little procedurally okay but in the same essence is going to apply we're going to be looping through all 45 but rather than worrying about these x and y coordinates here in quite the same way uh, we can do it a slightly different way uh, we've got we know brick number uh, and while our brick number is less than 45 or the other way of doing it we know that 45 is also bricks alive dot length and so then that way we could change the length and then we affect anything bricks alive dot length and we will run this loop increasing brick number each time okay so we've got something going on and while brick number is is less than the length of the number of bricks we have which is 45 uh, we're going to keep going through and so we want to check for each individual brick number am i passing through that particular okay so we're going to create an x brick and a y brick similar to what like we did here all right x brick starts at 20 and it's what we were using up the top here wasn't it yes and the y brick was also 20. so x brick is 20 uh, y brick 
20 here, I've got these little exclamations, right? X brick is already defined, Y brick is already defined. That's because I created them up here. Right, so I don't actually need this word var anymore because it already exists. But all I need to do is set it to the position, to the value that I want. Yeah, okay. Um, let's fix this up as well. Create bar y brick up the top here. And then here with each loop, we'll just get rid of the bug. Okay, and that'll fix up the error. Uh, basically, the error was being caused because I had a, the, the word var in here. And so the variable technically only exists within these curly braces. Uh, so I could then create another variable down here called y brick. Uh, but the reason I was getting the error is the program was saying, look, Ybrick doesn't really exist here, but I know you created something called Ybrick later on, and if that's the one that you're intending to use, you can't, you know, it doesn't really quite work. Um, the program warning me that there is a potential problem. Uh, so I'm making those quick little changes I've just done. It's got rid of the error message. I'm letting the program know, yes, I'm aware that this Ybrick exists elsewhere. Okay. Now, every time I am looping through this. Actually, I need these at the start of my loop, don't I? All right, so before I loop through my 45 bricks, let's reset, okay, I'm looking at brick, uh, X brick starting at 20 and Y brick starting at 20. As I loop through, the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, to move on to each relevant brick. All right, my Y bricks increased by 40, my X bricks increased by 70. All right, so Y brick is equal to Y brick plus 40. So I made that same error as previous, put in the Y. All right, and if Y brick is larger than, how many does this go for? This goes to 200. All right, so if Y brick is larger than 200, then I'm going to set Y brick back to 20 and increase, move on to my X bricks. All right, so that moves between each brick that I'm looking at. Okay, so but that's after having a look at the individual brick because this is these are the values that I need for my first brick. I need to check if I, uh, well, if the ball is bouncing off this particular brick, All right, and then I'm adjusting the X brick and Y brick values for the next loop. How do I check if the ball is bouncing this particular brick? All right, very similar to what I've got going on here. If the exit position is greater than or equal to X brick, all right, because that's the top, that's the left edge of the brick, so I don't need the minus 25 already. If the X position is less than or equal to X brick plus the 50. If the Y position of the ball is greater than or equal to Y brick, and if the Y position is less than or equal to Y brick plus 20, that means the ball is passing through this particular brick. Excellent, so what do I want to happen when the ball hits the brick? I want to kill that brick. And I know that to do that, I use this bricks alive. So that bricks alive for which particular number inside bricks alive. Well, I've got my brick number here. And I just need to set it to something other than zero. So it equals one. And we'll see that as the ball moves through those bricks, they will disappear. All right, that's all very good. But really, I need it to do more than that. I need the ball to bounce off of those bricks. All right, we're going to make the assumption since the bricks are longer width-wise than they are height-wise, that we are bouncing off the vertical. 
Uh, so we're, we're going to change the y value of our, change our y direction okay, rather than worrying about oh should we be bouncing off the left or whatever. Okay, and so to do that, I need to change my y direction. Now, how do I know if I want to change my y direction to be positive y, uh, positive five or minus y? I don't really need to know. I just need to know that I want the opposite of what it currently already is. If it's positive y, so that it's coming down, then it, and it hits a brick, then it needs to become minus y to move up. Likewise, if it's minus y, the ball is moving up, then it hits a brick, and it needs to be positive y to move down. So I just need to say y direction is equal to the inverse, the swap, the swap the sign of whatever y direction already was. So because uh, if it's positive five, there's a, there's a glitch here that we'll fix up in a sec. All right, think about this: if y direction is positive five, then it's, the minus sign is going to turn it into minus five. If it's minus five, the y direction is minus five currently, then it becomes minus minus five, which will turn it into positive five. Okay, so what's the little glitch that's going on here? At the moment, we're bouncing off bricks that even even if the bricks don't aren't appearing, okay, because we aren't actually checking here. Does the brick is the brick still alive uh, before we decide we're going to bounce off of it? We'll insert one last if statement here. If bricks alive, brick number is equal to zero, All right, whoops. that is when we will do these. So I'll cut those, paste them into there, and now we won't be bouncing off bricks that no longer appear. That's flowing a lot better. Okay, so our game is almost complete. Probably just make the ball start a bit lower in the game so it's not going through and wiping out half the bricks before we even start. So where's the starting position for our game? Okay, y, so the x and y are for, for the ball. So let's make it start at 250 instead of 150. So it's a little lower in the screen. It has to bounce off the panel before it starts taking out the first bricks. Well, that's starting to play a lot more how we'd expect. The last thing we need to do is keep a score so we can see if we are beating our mates. All right, so we will simply do that by bar score equals zero. This is the easy part. All right, we gain a score every time we hit a brick. All right, and we know that we're hitting bricks here. All right, so score is equal to score plus one. And then when the game finishes, Let's print out a score. All right, so we'll come up here where we draw the game over. We'll draw dot text score, All right, and we'll add our score number to that. We'll put it in roughly the same place: two hundred and three thirty. Make that read as well. All right, so now we will get a score when the game finishes. Okay, so now we get a score when our game finishes, and there you have it, we have that's a simple little breakout game. I hope you enjoyed making that, gained an appreciation of, the, of what it's like to do some real coding instead of just playing with blocks all the time. If you are interested in more, like I said, there are videos that I have created for my after school activities club on uh, an introduction to coding. Um, please feel free to look at those. You can access them through my website, paulbaumgarten.net. Then click on Courses, and then click on ASA, and you will find the video links in there. Don't forget the Game Programming Challenge. Ask your teacher about that. And finally, I have a quick little survey I would appreciate if you could fill out for me, uh, just indicating if you found this activity to be useful. Uh, if you are interested in anything more about programming, please feel free to come and find me and talk to me. I'm always happy to help students out who are interested in programming and get them up and running uh, because it's an incredibly valuable and fun skill to learn. And so uh, I wish you all the best in that and I uh, hope you continue to pursue it further. All right, this is Mr. Baumgarten signing off.